uh, of Mass National, is also a board member of the Interfaith Center of Public Life, is also a board member of Harvard University Islam and the West Project, uh, and uh, with Boston Muslim uh, Survey. And then I have uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman Khan next to him, uh, who's a graduate of the uh, Islamic University in Medina, Faculty of Sharia, and specializing in Islamic inheritance. He was the former principal of the Guyana Islamic Institute for a period of eight years. Now he's the resident scholar and khatib uh, at the Islamic Foundation Villa Park in Chicago over here and is actively involved in the field of Dawah. Uh, he is uh, was the chair, chairman of the ICNA uh, Sharia Council and executive member of the Fiqh Council of North America. I will come all of them and will uh, quickly uh, tell you what each, what each speaker is going to do. Dr. Jamal Badawi is going to give us kind of a uh, just understanding the concept, building the foundation for the topic. And then uh, Dr. Imad will come after that and will educate us about the diversity involved over here. And he'll, he'll encourage us and, and motivate us to join the caravan and gain the positive interaction. And then we'll have Sheikh Abdurrahman here, uh, inshallah, will come and tell us about the challenges and the problems we face and the cooperation that we need. And then lastly, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, uh, Brother Hussam coming to us to educate us about the, the resources that we need, the limitations that we have, the dream, dreams that we want to achieve. Hopefully this will give us a good background. Meanwhile, while each speaker is presenting and you have questions, please write them down and send them to me. I don't think the place is equipped with microphones where you can verbally ask your questions. Maybe we can uh, discuss this for future presentations. But for now, I would appreciate it if you send the uh, questions or comments uh, beforehand at the end of the speech of each speaker so that I can give it to him so that he can look at it as early as possible. Thank you, and may I invite Dr. Jamal to come and present. And Dr. Jamal will be talking for about 25 minutes, inshallah. I think you will see it here. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. First of all, my gratitude after gratitude to Allah سبحانه وتعالى to the organizers and to you all for taking time and more importantly for all my shiuch and teachers who are here with the panel who honored me actually by being one of them. The topic uh, has 11 slides. The title is one, so we finished with one already. Uh, the next one, I can't see what's coming on the, um, I think if you can return it back to the table of contents, just one before that. This one is only forward. Okay. okay. I can't the, go through here. They have to can you? So okay. If the audio visuals please can help us listen to Dr. Jamal for a few minutes, please, and get us going. Maybe he needs to go back. We can't control it from here. So okay. he'll, he'll help us, inshallah. Three, out, three basic questions in the outline. One is civic responsibility, a religious obligation on Muslims. Secondly, even if it is, does it apply to the situation of Muslim minorities in non-Islamic nations like America, Canada, Europe? And the third question that will take most of the time, in fact, disproportionately, how to relate 
to the larger society without losing identity and the various strategies that has been in debate for many years. In the next slide, we deal with the first question in a very brief and concise manner. Is it a religious obligation? My humble answer to that is yes. Three supporting evidence for this. One, faith itself, being a Muslim, means to be civically engaged. In fact, Islam being a complete way of life, or living, to be more accurate, actually implies that one should be involved in the affairs of any society anywhere. Secondly, I'd just like to comment that this involvement should include as well political involvement. Uh, I don't particularly like the confused and confusing term political Islam, as if there is some Islam and there is political Islam. This is a complete way of living which includes governance as well. The second point is that the civic responsibility and engagement is itself a manifestation of faith, for in Islam faith and action are intertwined. Thirdly, when we carry our civic responsibilities in any society we're living in, in fact, we are reinforcing our faith. When we contribute something beneficial and positive to the society where we're living, that sense uh, of satisfaction and contribution reinforces, in fact, our faith so it doesn't become just a theory that we are living that faith. Second question. Yes, that's fine, but maybe in Muslim societies, some might say. Does it apply to Muslim minorities when society itself is, quote unquote, non-Islamic? The answer, again, in my humble estimate is definite yes, because Islam guides our actions not in every facet, but everywhere we are. And the whole land, the whole planet Earth, and the universe is, uh, belong, or belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second point is that some people are trapped in that attitude. Everything in Muslim countries is nice and dandy and perfect. Everything in the West is nothing but evil, wrong, and moral decay. This is not just or fair. And uh, I think those of you who lived here long enough or were born here already, you know that there are some values and some practices among non-Muslims that are actually Islamic in its nature. Like Sheikh Muhammad Abdu, when we once went to Europe, and he said, what did you see? He said, in Europe, I saw Muslims, but no Islam. I came back to find Islam, but no Muslims, meaning no Muslim abiding by the rule of Islam. So the sweeping generalization that everything in the West is decadent and bad is wrong. There are things that are wrong. There are things that are right as well. But to be fair also, as the Quran teaches us, that we have to be self-critical also. How about the Muslim countries, so-called? How much Islam can we find there already? We can say also in all candidness that not all cultural norms or practices of Muslim in the so-called Muslim world are Islamic. Many are even contrary to the teaching of Islam. In other words, many are not only non-Islamic, but even un-Islamic, because non-Islamic could be neutral, un-Islamic even, going contrary to the teaching of Islam. The third point is that the, the variety of ayat in the Quran that speak about accepting plurality, ethnic plurality, racial plurality, uh, plurality in terms of gender, uh, plurality, religious plurality also, when the Quran teaches us in chapter 10, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا If Allah willed, all people on earth would have believed, meaning in the, the same religion. So that also shows that a Muslim should not feel like a stranger in any society simply because there are people other than Muslims or because even the majority themselves are, uh, are uh, Muslims, uh, non-Muslims or other faith communities. I'm not going to detail that because the, these values are very well known. We're just trying to relate them to the topic. But the most important question uh, to me really is the... Uh, the strategies as to how, as Muslims, we can relate to the broader society in which we live. Of course, 
in the context of Muslims in, in North America and similar settings.